Happy Sabbath again, everyone. Happy Sabbath, and uh, let us pray to begin. Gracious Eternal Father, we want to thank you for the sustenance of our lives. We pray that your Holy Spirit will remain with us. Please forgive us where we have sinned against you, and may we continue to learn so that as the weeks go by, we will be learning more and more how to keep your Sabbath holy. Teach us how to love you so that we can obey you in all that you have commanded us. I pray that even now as we go into this session for today, that by the power of your Holy Spirit and the willingness of our heart, the openness of our hearts, that we will be edified and that we will be healed individually as a family, as a church, so that your work can be finished here on earth. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray. Amen. Right, so we would have started to look at healing of the home a few weeks back, so I will just give a brief recap and then we will continue in our study. All right. It is no small matter for a family to stand as representatives of Jesus, keeping God's law in an unbelieving community. We are required to be living epistles known and read of all men. This position involves fearful responsibilities. Adventist home page 31. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Adventist Home, page 32. The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be represented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend the truth as nothing else can for it is a living witness of the practical power upon the heart Adventist home page 32 so nothing can declare to the world the gospel of God than that of a well-ordered well-disciplined family so it highlights how important it is that our families be in line with the principles of God. All right. The three components of a home as we looked at the individual where in Genesis 2 verse 7 God formed Adam and the moments later he would have formed Eve. Right? And we saw where he would have spent time with them individually before bringing them together as a couple and that is where we see the next component of a home which is a couple and then he commanded them to to extend this couple relationship into a more extensive family right he told them to multiply to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 1 verse 20 verses 26 to 28 so we see the three components of a family First, we are individuals. We have an individual responsibility to God. Second, the couple. And then the extended family where children will be included. So when in the judgment, we will not be judged as a couple. We will be judged as individually. But then as a couple, we will be judging what influence did we have upon each other. And even at, you know, with our children, how did we grow them in the way of the Lord? Uh, broken homes are the reason for the condition of our church, and we admit that this is a true statement. Proverbs 4 verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And the word keep means to guard. Society is composed of families, and it is what the heads of families make it. Out of the heart are the issues of life, and the heart of the community, of the church, and of the nation is the household. The well-being of society, the success of the church, 
The prosperity of the nation depend upon home influences. All right, so why is there so many crime in the world? Why, there's, why is there apostasy in the church? It's because the home is in disarray. So to fix these problems, we have to go to the root cause of the problem. The same way we are to guard our hearts is the same way we are to guard our homes. So the, the heart is, is the center of the man, right? Likewise, the heart of society, the heart of the church is the home is the family the heart of man is the mind the heart of society is the home because of sin we have wandered far from God and he seeks to bring us back into a personal relationship with him Malachi 4 verses 5 to 6 says behold I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers as I come and smite the earth with a curse. So here Jesus is telling us in order for us to be prepared for his coming, our heart, minds and our homes must be healed. The Spirit of God must do a work in us before Christ comes. So he's not going to sin literal Elijah. Just like the Spirit of Elijah came in the time of Christ, in who? And who did who had the spirit of Elijah in the time of Christ? Hmm? Right, John the Baptist. And what was his message? What was John the Baptist doing? He was preparing the hearts of of the people to be prepared for the coming of Christ. He was telling them to repent. He was telling them to forsake their sin and to turn to to, to, to God. Right? Likewise, in our times, we must return to the way of the Lord. Our families must be found in the way of the Lord before he comes. Luke 4, verses 9, 18 and 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus came to heal those who were affected in the mind, those who were dealing with issues of the heart, issues at the heart of society, issues in the home. Alright? Satan's unceasing work is to attack the mind, our heart. The controversy is over our mind. Do we understand that? Do we understand this whole great controversy is about the mind? It's about the law of God and and who we will it's about the law of God and if we will use our mind to serve him. It's all about our mind and this is why the enemy is seeking to attack our mind from every every angle up till up until the day that christ comes he will still be attacking our minds and that is why it says that we must be able to endure weariness hunger and delay all hung when you're hungry it affects the mind your mind becomes clouded your judgments are not are not correct in most cases that is why we need to be sober so even when we are hungry we don't make bad decisions. And this is why we need to make fasting a part of our, our lifestyle because it helps us to, to gain control over the, the hunger pangs, right? Right, the controversies against God's twin institution, the home or the family and the Sabbath or the church. If he succeeds in destroying the farmer, the former then there can be no upholding of the latter and once again just to emphasize there's no way we can keep the sabbath holy if the family is in disarray the mind will be in distress it can't happen right genesis 1 verse 26 we were created in god's image for us to reflect his image as an individual. He made man happy, healthy, and holy as a whole individual. Right? Before entering a marriage covenant, we are to be found whole, not free from character defects, 
but having oneness with Christ as an individual rather than seeking another to make us whole. Adam was not incomplete while God gave him a, a helpmeet. He was perfect just the way that God made him. Right? Right. So when we say that, you know, I have found my better half, my other half, or he makes me whole, she makes me whole, those statements are not to be uttered. We are to be whole. We are to be one with Christ. Because God says when the, when the two comes together, they do not make, well, he said they make one, but not one in where I was not complete before I met my husband. We are to have that oneness in Christ. So it's two whole persons that are to come together. Right? Because what happens if, if, if your partner dies, then you're, you're a peace now. I mean... Hmm? By whole? Meaning, as I was saying, it doesn't mean that you're free from character defect. But you have oneness with Christ. You, you and Christ have a, a relationship. You, you know who you are in Christ. He completes you. You don't need your partner to, to, to give you joy because you were, were already experiencing joy in Christ. You can express if, you, if I'm not clear or if it doesn't. It's of the notion that Adam was not incomplete before God made Eve. He was completely an individual, right? So we must be a com we must have we must not be dependent upon somebody else to make us a person, right? We must have our own individuality. We must have a relationship with Christ. So even if we don't get a partner, we are still an individual while some persons you know it's upon finding somebody they say that oh I have found my other half I have found the person who completes me God didn't make any half a person or any piece of person we are supposed to have that individuality <laughs> all right you can express if if it's if it's not Or if somebody else understand and can express it in another way that makes it more clear. No, um, but um, and then. So I agree with the individuality part um, because even when you're married, you should maintain your individuality in the marriage. But as it relates to um, talking about completeness. When God made Adam, um, he came and he communed with him. And it said, I think, in Patriarchs and Prophets, um, that chapter that talks about the creation, it said that even companionship with and communion with God and companionship with angels was not sufficient for him because the desire for love and sympathy, God had put it in his heart. And so he needed someone like himself that could sympathize with him and care and love him. And that was, that's a thing that God puts in each and every one of us. So it's not that he was incomplete because he was a whole person and he had communion with God, which was wonderful because he was in a sinless state. But he still had that desire that God put in him himself for love and sympathy and companionship. So I think that there is a, maybe a fine line between saying that, you know, you're not whole, because yes, you are whole and you have individuality and a relationship with God, but there's also something in us that God put in us naturally that we have that desire for companionship and love and sympathy. Right, and it brings forth a joy to know that you meet somebody who share the same purpose are the same um, you know the same ideas that you share so there's there's a joining there but it's just it's just a society thing where I am not until I found I have found 
such and such a person. It's, it's just a dependence upon another to feel some form of wholeness. Right. Right. All right. All right, next person quickly. I think you, you're both saying two, dif two different things. In, in one sense, in one sense, um, we are all to have a personal relationship with Christ. Um, we are to know our maker as an individual, and we are to gain happiness from our maker as an individual, as a person. We're not, in, other, in other words, we're not supposed to be dependent on any other person, whether it be husband or brother or sister, it's just Jesus. And in the next sense, um, as human beings, we are social and we need people that are on our levels that we can relate to. So it's it's not it's the de it's the independency. We're not dependent on any other person, but we still need them. And it's like Paul said, um, I am free of all men, but servant of all. You know, we're not in, in a state where we cannot um, make it through our days if we don't talk to this person or that person. But on the other sense, we're still social beings, if, if that makes sense. Okay. So, um, uh, but do the two persons have to be on the same level that are, s are together? If, if what? No, she said that this, the person on the same level, so I mean, not, I'm just asking if they have to be on the same level. I mean, we must have a certain understanding that are on the same level. I mean, so other things we, we learn together and we grow, but certain principles must be on the same level. Unless out of ignorance. All right. All right. The gospel deals with individuals. Every human being has a soul to save or to lose. Each has an individuality separate and distinct, distinct from all others. Each must be convicted for himself, converted for himself. He must receive the truth, repent, believe, and obey for himself. He must exercise his will for himself. No one can do this work by proxy. No one can submerge his individuality in another's. Each must surrender to God by his own act and the, mis and the mystery of godliness. Manuscript 28, 1898. As Christ ministered on earth, he also pronounced those who look to him in faith whole. John 10 verse 10, the thief cometh, the thief cometh but to, sorry, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. As, the in, as individuals sit and have stolen the joy of salvation. In God's church, many are sad, angry, unhappy, depressed, all kind of mental perplexities. Many of us are not happy or healthy, and hence, as far as being holy, sorry, and hence are far from being holy. What are some of the things that affect individuals that cause them not to be whole before entering into the marriage covenant? All right, we looked at them, insecurities, fairy tales, Peer pressure, past relationships, childhood trauma, heartache, anger, fear, confusion, anxiety, insecurity, all of those things. So we said that we would focus a little on childhood trauma. Trauma is a person's emotional response to a distressing experience. It results from exposure to an incident or a series of events that are emotionally disturbing or life-threatening with last 
lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, and or spiritual well-being. Experiences that may be traumatic include physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, childhood neglect, living with a family member with mental health or substance use disorders, sudden unexplained separation from a loved one, poverty, racism, discrimination, and oppression, violence in the community, war, The not so little traumas, the divorce of a parent, the sudden death of a close loved one or pets, getting bullied in school, being cut from a sport team or choir when uh, all your close friends made it, rejection, being told you're not good enough, being compared with others, not being invited somewhere. All of these things create um, a traumatic experience for many persons, hence why we are how we are today. childhood or past trauma. There are many who are growing, many who are grown, many single, many married, planning to get married, many divorced, but we have not dealt with a very serious issue that, and that is trauma we have suffered. This issue impacts our individuality and how we relate to others and even how we relate to God. The way in which we study and understand the Bible is also affected by the things that we have suffered. And this is why we are going in circles and we, are, we cannot grow spiritually because though we read and understand, we cannot make the application because of the blockage in our minds that are not addressed. Right, so we might have gone through some things in our past and we cannot go forward because we have not dealt with those situations. When our brain is exposed to an intense situ situation of potential danger, God uses our emotions as a warning system. Anxiety, fear, sadness, anger, all let us know something isn't right, that danger exists or that we are not seeing things accurately. Then our mind scans our memory banks to search for information that can help us assess the current situation. Once we have that data, our minds determine how to react and with what intensity. All right. We remember what we read about these? All right. So let me just hasten. All right. All right, so trauma, again, is a tool of the enemy to push us off the track of following Christ. We have to examine our lives as individuals and ask, why are we not where God would want us, where God would have us? Why are we taking so long to gain the victory? Having read and understood and striving and, and everything, why is there still no righteous fruit? Do we continue to blame it on our sinful nature? You know, everything we say, oh, because Adam and Eve and sin, you know, we, we, we blame it on something else. And we are doing the exact thing that they did, finding someone or something to blame. So instead of admitting that I'm a liar, you know, I blame it and say it's because that person did this. They caused me to be thinking that our... I felt pressured, so I just tell a little lie, or if I told the truth, somebody will get hurt. We find excuses instead of admitting um, the real cause of the problem. Do we continue to blame it on heredity? You know, we said that it's because my mother was this, or my mother is like this, or I was grown this way. Well, not grown, it's not heredity. But we blame it on our past parents, that these, our past parents, grandparents, that they are the reason. They pass it down to us. Hence why we are how we are. Do we even identify the true cause, but is still bound by the emotions? So you may, you know, identify why, <laughs> you know, you're so angry. And you, you, know, you know the reason why you 
get angry every time but we have not learned how to to let God help us with dealing with the emotions and so there is no growth we continue to deal with the situation the same way because we are not um, we don't know how to manage the emotions that come with the, 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 the cause right, do we continue to blame sin and Satan right you know when I used to say that the Satan this Satan that we give so much power to him so much glory to him you know when we make so much mention of of him I mean if he's able to make you do all these things he is powerful eh? so we need to you know um, look at these things we well, understand everybody um, Or do we actually deal with the issue and seek God's overcoming power? So as we identify certain things in our lives, do we actually um, focus on dealing with, with it by God's help and guidance? There are many among us who are past and present sufferers the trauma from their past has molded their character where they don't have where they don't have an individuality or they don't know how to deal with harsh realities many are suffering and are not coping they can't speak about it because church people talk a lot we talk too much we don't keep things somebody open up to us about things that they are going through things that they have been through and before you know it, the whole church knows about it. And somebody else may see that. And they are, too are suffering. But because they see how we deal with that situation, they refrain from opening up and they continue to suffer. They can't speak about it because they are protecting the reputation of the abuser, whether present or past. So if my husband is you know a minister and he's not he's doing things that he's not supposed to be doing out of respect for his reputation i will with i will you know keep secrets certain aspect of you know his character to protect him so many many persons suffer in this way right to protect the reputation of others they can't speak about it because they don't want to be vulnerable so if i'm going through an experience and i don't want persons to see the vulnerability of me you know i choose to keep it in and continue to suffer <laughs> and continue to suffer right but God's people must be able to discern and cater to the suffering that are not present. Sorry, that are present in our midst. So even us, we we are supposed to be able to discern the signs that this person is going through something, and by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, reach out to them, or even um, indirectly um, minister to them indirectly try to, to, to share with them right so that they can be be helped any comments brother Nick so you said earlier that we need to find the root cause and um, you know, pray about the remedy and see if we can work on resolving um, the issue by taking away the root cause. So it's not just about what you said so far is correct. Um, you were saying that something about what happens in the home and the different issues at home. Yeah, that would be the um, the cause of it, but the ultimate root cause starts from when the person or persons were
single. So what I mean by that is um, if the person does not have a, a relationship with God or they don't walk with God from that particular stage when they're single or they don't walk with God or carry God with them then um, when they jump into marriage now then the problem would start from there so it would start from when they're single until when they find somebody and then they get married and then it starts to spiral down from that point then it go down to the children and then it spreads into the family and then it spreads to the church right and that's why we start at the individual the 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 issues that we face must start from from the individual how we are scarring our children because it starts even as as children right most persons are suffering from childhood up into adulthood and so as they become a man and a woman is like they're still a child or they're still suffering from things many persons are suffering from things that happen long 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 ago from they were a little child and they're still um, suffering we pass down these curses to our children because they reflect our characters and often they feel the wrath of our unpleasant emotions if we do not deal with our issues as, as individuals we pass them down to our children and it continues to the third and the fourth generation do we have any bible examples of how um, <coughs> we would have seen how the the effects of an individual it's you know it affected um, the generations to come Salomano, you have to explain. Um, so he, because of his apostasy later on um, in his life, he caused the kingdom of Israel to be rented, um, split apart, basically. And his children... Um, um, I guess because of that, um, a lot of bad things would have happened. I'm not remembering off the bottom of my head, but I know his doings would have caused. And also David with his son Absalom. Um, he, because of whatever reason, he would have gone um, AYS. So I guess it, it comes down in the genes. So as I was reading, it's not necessarily immediate from the immediate parents, but it can be passed down, as it says, from to the, fir, um, the third and fourth generation. So it can come from even your great grandparents and come down to the children. Right. Um, but more specifically, in terms of the generation suffering um, a traumatic experience. Any example? All right. How about um, how about Belteshazzar? Our, I mean, he he carried around anger. You know, he 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 carried around anger, or maybe Cain, Cain. He he would have he would have been somewhat traumatized from this separation. And he blamed God. And so, you know, we see the effect of that because he did not dealt with it as how God would have guided them. So, I don't know, that would be a, a, a traumatic um, situation. It's just the hurt of the past, but how it impacts the individual would you later. Would blame Cain for that and not his parents, based on how his parents brought him up as probably spoiled him thinking that he was a savior. Cain? It wasn't that what you said? Yes. Cain, yes. They did not spoil him. He was he he was re 
rebellious. He was not spoiled. By his parents, yes. Hmm? Yes. He was not spoiled. Yes. Where do you get that? Art. You're saying Adam and Eve spoiled Cain? Yes. No, they did not. Because they thought he would have been the savior that Christ. That Hence, God they would not spoil him. That's why he was brought up so special. Which no, means but special now. does not mean spoil. Hence, why they would not have spoiled him. Uh, so he chose I, to be rebellious. He chose to be rebellious. Mm -hmm. So the strict growing up, he rebelled against that. Yes, because he he thought that God was unfair. No, S to to to. To, 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 to understand that your child is special which all of us children we should think that our children are special not to prize them but to grow them in the way of the Lord that is not to spoil them there's nowhere in the Bible or the testimony that shows that they, they, they slacked up in their upbringing if more than anything they would have done the very best that they could have done having repented of, of bringing sin upon this earth Any comment before I move on? I was going to mention Lot and um, the Moabites that came from him because he, his daughter slept with him and the, that offspring led to a nation that was very rebellious against God. Okay. <coughs> Parents who exercise a spirit of dominion and authority transmitted to them from their own parents, which leads them to be exacting in, in their discipline and instruction, will not train their children aright. By this severity in dealing with their errors, they store up the worst passions of the human heart and leave their children with a sense of injustice and wrong. They meet in their children the very disposition that they themselves has, have imparted to them. Parents have fixed the eternal destiny of their children by their own misrule. And this is, a, this is a very serious and true statement. If we do not become conscious, then the same way that our parents have dealt with us, the Holy Spirit have shown me where I am doing the same thing. <laughs> And it's 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 not it's not it's, it's not, I'm laughing, but it's not a laughing matter. It's not a laughing matter. So we have to be very sober, and 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 be very aware of what the testimony have to say in our upbringing of our children, lest we continue this curse of how they have grown us, and we in turn grow our children and and traumatize them. We have been traumatized by their severity and we often in turn do the same thing. So we have to be conscious because at the, part, the end of it he says that we'll fix their final eternal destiny, right, if we do not um, take heed. And, and um, I learned something about children, like my, my, my friend, my godchildren, um, one time I was asking the, the daughter to, to do something for me and she was there ignoring me, you know, I was asking her to throw away something and she's, she was about two and I said, Zuri, throw, throw this away for me and she didn't really ignore me and I, say, and I just stopped asking her and I don't pay her any mind and then I was on the phone and then after a while see she come up to me and like she, she wants to do it and I just said, here, go and throw it away for me and she just run to throw it away so because I didn't exercise any authority over her, she was just testing me at first to see how I would respond. And I find that when you don't try to, 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 give, to have this do dominance over children, they love you and they just gravitate to you and they, they willingly want to do what you ask them to do. So we, we, don't, we don't always have to, like, you can discipline in you know, but you don't have to behave like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm better than you. You must listen to me because Je Jesus isn't like that. You know, Jesus does not exercise that kind of authority over us because even Jesus said to the man at one point, um, 
do, do, do you want me to have some authority? Like, I think the man came to him and he was saying, Lord, tell this man to give me something, some of the inheritance. And Jesus said, who gave me authority over you? So Christ gives us free will. And we have to understand that children still have that free will. I mean, you can instruct them, but it's how you do it. You know, it's not from this puffed up and controlling way but you can respect them and ask them and give them the, their, their little opinion if they don't feel like doing it right now just say try again another time but you don't have to you know try to rigidly control them right as the, as the testimony says we must study minds we we must study the minds of individuals so that the spirit will be able to, to, to lead us how to, to, to um, deal with the different minds. Alright, warning signs you. Warning signs that you or someone has been through or is still going through trauma. So if you have a bad, unpredictable temper where you just burst out or you damage things, you know, some persons they throw things, they break things. If this is you, then you know you need to investigate more and ask God to, to, to help you. If they intimidate or threatens to hurt or kill, say if you do this or you know somebody who does that, don't take it light. And they threaten to commit suicide if you leave them or if they don't get what they want or if you feel like if you don't have this, you know, I remember. Um, last year there was this young lady she had a baby and the baby was in some the baby was in ICU at first um for a time and she was saying that if the baby dies you know she is going to cause herself to die as well you know and the thought was but I mean I mean it's her baby but you were living all along before the baby you know and and you know but we have to, I wouldn't have said that to her, but you know, it's just the thoughts at times when we think that whatever, but when we, meet, when we are in these situations or when we meet persons who are in these situations, we have to know how to deal with it, all right? Um, if, if they are jealous of families, friends, or over the time, or if they are jealous about the time you see spend with them or away from them so if if your husband if you are if you feel jealous that your husband is spending too time with too much time with his family or his friends or if your husband or your somebody is feeling that way then there may be some issue there whether it's from a past relationship or family relationship um, they embarrass you in public control finances and hold iron rule in the household or business matters make you feel guilty for all the problems in the family if they pressure or force you to be intimate if you cry easily or if you see other you know if you experience that others cry easily if persons just go silent you may be talking to them and they go silent or you may be talking and you just drift off and gone silent something may be off there if you misinterpret the motive or conversation, so if somebody says something to you, or you say something with some, to somebody and they, you know, they just, they misinterpret, they always misinterpret what you're saying. They always misinterpret your sincerity. They always misinterpret or misunderstand, you know. You have to, um, you know, seek how you can help that person to even realize that there's an issue going on there. All right, the effects. All right, so, you know, because many of us were well beaten when we were growing up, <laughs> you know, so it's the same thing we do. We, we beat our children. And the council really says that we should not, you know, but. Let me let me let me add the rest of it. <laughs> now, let me just add the rest of it. There may be occasion, but you know, sister, if we give them one, one, one good beating, should do. But 
we should not abuse. We should not abuse. Because trust me, the beating does not do anything. Beating, beating does not do anything. If, if anything what beating does, it creates a distance. It creates a... In the mad for, for about 90% then, Brother Peters, it does nothing. It actually, it actually affects the mind more and, and creates a drift and fear. I, Brother Peters, not because you beat a child and that child listen. It does. No. Brother Peter, not because you beat a child and the child listen. It does not mean the child no respects you, you know. It means that the child fears you. And that is what we do not want. Brother Stores. All right, quickly. Okay, so, so, um, Brother Mark is emphasizing that the beating would have helped him. Um, but I can say that for maybe the 70s, 80s children that worked somewhat, but not these modern days kids, beating does not work with them at all. They don't, th yes, that's a point. So as you were saying with the council, it says that parenting doesn't start when the child is here and that is where we have gone wrong. It starts before you um, become pregnant. You, you both parents, when you look at um, John, so both parents has to be in union with Christ and then they are in union with each other so they can bring forth a seed that has the tendency to do good. And then while the child is being raised, they are also being taught in the right way. You can't have corrupt seed and expect your child going to come to be perfect. It's not going to work and that's not what the council says. And that is the reason why we beat them. And, and in, right, we can read the book, Child Guidance, Method of Discipline. And the truth of the matter, when we do beat, we don't beat to discipline, we beat to express our anger. We're expressing anger when we beat. And, and the testimony says, if we express anger when we discipline, we are more at fault than the children. We are actually committing sin when we discipline in anger, right? So beating is not, is not the super method. It's not a, it's, it doesn't work miraculously. We beat out of anger. And we shouldn't be angry. Are, are you telling me me beat the anger? No. All right. I don't. I don't. I don't beat my child um, regular, and I don't beat them with anger. I talk to them even when I I wasn't an Adventist. I even know anything about them. I I, I talk with them. Um, while growing up. Me used to get a lot of beating. It doesn't make me a worse a person than anyone. And if you look at this generation, you, you talk with them, you talk with them, you talk with them. And then do some things weird because of how they see some things. They feel like they, they get certain powers to do things because in the school, teachers are supposed to. From in the um, some homes, based on how the, the, the parent um, speak to their children, they go to school with the same attitude, and teacher can talk with them because they have so many powers. So if um, certain scrolling was was still taking place in in, in the in the schools, it wouldn't it wouldn't be so so as it is now. I'm not saying teachers supposed to uh, abuse the, the child, or parents supposed to uh, abuse the child. But based on what I'm seeing now, there's a lot of boundary that the, the student um, exploit them because of the, 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 the opportunity that, that, that are the powers that them, them give. And it's um, I can tell you though that beating is not the solution, and beating cannot rectify the, the problem. All right, I have five minutes. I have five minutes. Well, I'm sorry. Let me just, let me just, um, I'll let you have the final point, Brother Stuart. Let me just run through it. 
All right, so the solution, pray, never punish when you're angry, do not raise the voice. And these are according to the, to the council. He said that if we reason with them as, as if they have an intelligence, they will more um, cooperate and, 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 and be obedient. And sometimes it's our, way, it's our shortcoming while they end up doing these things. And then we are beating them for what we cause. Right, we are the one who cause them to be like this majority of the time. We have not guided them properly. We think that we are guiding them by dragging them to worship, dragging them to church, telling them to do this, telling them to do that. But we have not really led them the way that God says that we should. Right? Um, so for somebody who have been sexually abused, they may not trust anyone. They may be walking with God, but they don't fully trust Him because. You know, in their mind, why would he allow such a terrible thing to happen to me? Right? And the solution, pray. Trust that what the enemy meant for evil, God still wants to turn it around for good. Become a mentor. You know, you have persons who, they made this their, their ministry, where they share their testimony and how they have overcome as a means of um, encouraging other persons who have been through um similar situation and they become a voice for the voiceless for those who you know don't have anybody to speak up for them to look out for them they become one of such um the next one we were neglected so we don't know how to function in a relationship so growing up maybe your parents neglected you or even in a previous relationship you felt neglected or such a solution pray build a relationship with god Spend time with loved ones and make the effort to get closer to them. Do things together. So these are just some of the guidelines. Ask yourself, why am I so emotional? Why do I cry so easily? Why do I get so upset? Why everything bothers me? Hmm? Why has somebody step on my toe? I carry them in my heart for the whole year. Why, why am I so emotional? Hmm? Why the first thing that comes to my mind is something bad? Why is it that I get so angry when so-and-so. When I see Sister Danique, why, why do I get so cross? And Sister Danique doesn't do me anything, but she looks like somebody who I didn't know and I didn't like. So these are the things we are still carrying around and it's still affecting us and how we relate to each other. That is why we cannot be united as a church because we are carrying some long-time baggages that get heavier every year. And we, you know, we continue to bring it around and we unleash it on everybody. We, we give everybody a piece of something that's in the baggage. Right? Why is it that this person crossed my spirit so much? Why do I feel, why don't I feel any emotions when someone does me wrong? So you have some people, they get so easily emotional, while some people, they feel nothing. They have they have learned to numb their emotions and now they feel nothing and I, I I I don't remember what I read about this but only God well God alone can help all of us but there's a special work that must be done to reach these persons because it's as if they're 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 dead right and so God has to do a very special work for them and this is why we are to be very careful of how we speak to people how we relate to people how we respond to people because we know not what they have been through we know not what they are going through and so we have to be careful um why do i go silent in a crisis again it's it's that not knowing what to do with the emotions so you know they don't know how to challenge channel it they don't know what to do they are they have practice to just zone out right I think one time I used to do it I just I just started looking afar off just just afar off <laughs> a person would think that I'm looking at them but I'm not looking at them my mind is just you know not blank but just afar off while some persons are able to make it go blank and this is what they practice in these modern spiritualism yoga where they tell you to empty the mind and I didn't empty my mind I'll just stare and don't hear but you know we should not empty our minds
because demons will fool us up, right? We, sh we should always have the word of God in our minds and all his promises, all our experiences and all of that. Why do I get panicky so easily? Right? Some persons, they panic out of nowhere. They just panic. And they start get fretful and they start get flustered and they start wor worrying. Their hearts start beating and they don't know what to do. And so these are things that persons would have suffered in the past. Some of them, they can't identify, but you have to go back. You have to search back your life so God can show you what is the cause. Am I always trying to convince myself and others that I'm okay? Are you always trying to, you know, convince that, you know, yeah, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm all right. Yeah, man, I'm good. Don't worry yourself, I'm all right. You know, it's kind of a deception where you're trying to, you know, tell yourself that everything is okay when everything is not really okay. Why am I always so defensive, right? So you may ask, you know, I may ask Sister Fallon, Sister Fallon, why you wear blue today like me? And she started to get defensive and say, so what? Why if my mom wear blue or, you know, it's my clothes or, you know, she started to get defensive for no, no apparent. No, it's reality, you know. It's reality, persons. Well, unless we're not studying each other. We are to study each other, not to go home and gossip, but to pray and to, and to, to ask God to help us to um, really be of help to them because we are all... You know, we are sick. We need help. All right. All right. So because time is finished, I will have to continue next week. Um, let us pray. Right. Uh, Brother Smith, I'm going to give you the mic. Okay, well, he can make the point after, after. Sister Kaden, I, I was just going to suggest because the discipline of a child is extremely important. Subject. Um, especially with what we know goes on in the world today. Where the government generally almost remove the rod from adults from disciplining children. And, uh, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I agree with anything that has been said. I just use a rod because the Bible uses a rod. And, um, and, and we need to make sure that, that, th right, th well, no, that our, un that our understanding is, is ironclad in terms of what the Bible, you don't have to go back to it now. What I'm suggesting that we do is we, we have, a, have a special presentation on it where the writings of Sister White that is mentioned, that we bring them forward, because what you have is, you have persons who are disagreeing and questioning and so forth. And we don't want to, to leave those questions, ju just being questions, because the persons who are questioning are not convinced based on what you would have said. So we need to bring those information forward and present it. And I think you probably just need to have a session on the discipline of our children, especially based on what is going on in the world today, where we see the, the government and civil authority and so forth take a particular stand against the discipline of children. We want to make sure that we have the, the correct position. So I'm just suggesting that, we, that you do a session on it by itself, um, not far from now. Okay, we can do it when we after we do the couple and go to the extended family, we can bring it there in um, quickly. So um, quickly. Yes, well, personally, I'm one of the 80s baby, where beat and save most of my generation. Not to say sometimes it might go close to abuse, but discipline in art. The boundary has been so why know that you can't tell the difference but now based on learning from even the Bible you will get for understand so alright we took the approach wrong from the beginning but if it's bad 
or if it's getting bad, how do you stop it? You have to put it, get it in line at some point, at, in some way. It works. It to works. what extent does it work? If it does not, if it does not rectify the issue, if it does not bring about sincere when obedience, do, then it it, when it has we, not worked. When do we say that it doesn't help the issue? When when do we say it doesn't work? When the child is an adult, or when we are not getting the result that we think we are supposed to get? All right. As 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 is said, that we will go into it. We will go into that specifically further on. All right. Let us pray. Gracious Eternal Father, we want to thank you very much for your love and your mercies. Thank you for where we would have been edified and where we would have not. I pray that yeah, we will continue to read your testimonies and your words so that we can be brought into all truth. So that as individuals, we will be drawn closer to you and that in our relation to others, we will do as you lead us and as you are pleased with continue to be with us throughout the rest of this day in jesus wonderful name i pray amen